before we dive into our texts this morning, and there's going to be a few of them, let's, let's do a little thought experiment, okay? So you can close your eyes if you want, but uh, most of you can probably just envision this. So, so let's imagine that it's your birthday, but no one seemed to remember. So you, you grind through the day, and you don't get so much as a text or a Facebook mention, let alone a gift or a card or any, any sort of personal recognition from anybody. And so now you're just kind of resigned that everyone's forgotten. And after the long day, you, you come home to a dark and empty house. But then all of a sudden, the lights come on, and everybody yells, dozens of people, your friends and your family, all your closest people, and they say, surprise! And so you're like, okay, okay, that's more like it. People, people did remember me. And, and everyone gathers around, and the crowd begins to sing the familiar celebratory song. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. And you're kind of like, wait, what? What is going on here? And while they're singing about peanuts and Cracker Jacks, before the shot can really fully register for, uh, for you to make some sort of response to kind of correct everybody, hey, this, that's not the occasion, the crowd parts and your best friend comes out carrying a big pan. And they're like, first one, two, three, strikes you around, and they finish, and they're all clapping. And then they set the pan down in front of you, and your neighbor yells, all right, come on, let's carve that bird. And you're kind of like, what? And you look down, and it's, it's a big pan of a fully cooked, fully dressed turkey. And you're just kind of like, okay, that doesn't make sense. So you're just sort of shaking your head in, in, in disbelief. And uh, before you can really move on from that, somebody yells, hey, guys, come on, the fireworks are starting, let's go. And everybody leaves to go outside to watch a fireworks display. And you kind of are just sitting there, and you look at your spouse who's there just beaming at you. And, and they ask, well, honey, were you, were you surprised? And you go, y- yes, absolutely. But, but before you can inquire about the strangeness of it all, they say, Happy New Year, honey. And then they kiss you on the cheek. But right after, they, they pinch your arm and go, I can't believe you didn't wear green. And before there's some, somebody got it. And before you can tear your hair out in utter confusion, the doorbell rings and your spouse goes, that'll be the trick-or-treaters. Did you remember to pick up the candy on your way home from work? But by this point, you're just catatonic. You just can't even. So they say, don't worry, I'll get it. And they head back toward the front door. And you're left standing agape in the living room by yourself under the mistletoe. And scene. Okay. So that's a silly story that I made up, um, like many of my illustrations. But the, the, the point I have is simple, which is that in our little tale, you probably begin to realize that even in our secular culture, there are lots of little traditions, lots of rituals, really. And these rituals have intended contexts, intended purposes, shared understandings. If you remove the context or the shared understanding, the whole thing sort of loses its meaning and gets wonky really quickly. And in the Christian church, the the same is true of of our rituals. And and so that's where we're going to turn today. Today we're going to talk about ordinances, the, the rituals of the Christian faith. And I know some of you are probably already balking just kind of at that word, at that word ritual, because you probably have grown up and taught that, that Christianity is, is anything but ritualistic. We, we can't complete a series of sacred rites in order to be made holy, right? That's, that's gospel 101. Where it's antithetical to the teaching of, of, of Jesus Christ. We're, we're saved by grace through faith, after all. It's a gift of God. Nobody could possibly work to attain God's favor, and we would all affirm that. But yet, all across Protestant Christianity, we identify and practice regularly to rituals, which we call ordinances. They are baptism and the Lord's Supper. And so, as we talk about how Christ built his church, we have to talk about his ordinances, and why these rituals were instituted. So the first thing we have to do is get the context right. We have to get back uh, what sort of a function any ritual could have in a religion that is based on grace. So if it's not to achieve or attain salvation of any kind, then, then what is the ritual for? Did these things kind of just happen to get adopted over time as the church evolved and grew and said, well, hey, we kind of need our things. Do we, need, we need to start 
doing things to make this feel more significant? Or, or was it something more? Well, we have to start with Scripture if we're going to get anywhere. So let's look at one of the most quoted passages here at Tomball Bible Church. That is Matthew 28, 19 and 20. And it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So the most obvious point to mention here is, is that Jesus is talking. Jesus is talking. He is giving a final word, a final instruction to his disciples and to the church at large, we would say. This is our mission at Tomball Bible Church as well. We rephrase it. But essentially, we are pulling our mission right from this very text of Scripture. And you begin to see what an ordinance actually is in the Protestant church. It's a ritual or ceremony that was instituted by Christ Jesus himself. And likewise, this is true of the Lord's Supper, which Christ himself instituted with his disciples, as shown in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But it's Paul's recounting of the Supper that shows us how it was practiced in the early church. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, this is Paul speaking. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So we'll, we'll discuss that passage further in, in a moment. But for now, what we need to bring out is, is verse 23, that Paul received the same story written in the Gospels as part of the testimony of Jesus' death which he recounts as the familiar Lord's Supper narrative in verses 24 and 25, with the command, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So here we need to see that, that this was a, mem- a remembrance that was meant to be regularly observed. It was as often as you eat the bread together and drink the cup together. So this too was instituted by Christ, but unlike baptism, which is done only once, as an inaugural rite, as an inaugural ritual into the Christian faith, the Lord's Supper Supper is a continuing ritual that's done regularly. And in fact, we we know from the church fathers that that these two rituals, above any others, were held as institutions to be observed all across the global church. And the earliest church fathers gave these rituals the name Mysterion, which is just mystery, right? Right? They did this in light of the mystery of the incarnation of Jesus Christ himself. That's 1 Timothy 3.16. And the mystery of Christ and his church. That's Ephesians 5.31. But after a couple centuries, as Greek faded from everyday Christian life, at least in, in, in the Western part of Christianity, the word was given a Latin translation by an early church father named Tertullian. I know this is getting kind of deep into church history, but, but, but the point here is the Latin word was sacramentum or what we would say, sacrament, which is our transliteration of the Latin word. And that that word had sort of a double meaning in Latin because it it meant, the root word of it meant a thing set apart as sacred. So we're kind of still in the ballpark of this is a sacred ritual. This is something that's set apart, that's designed by Christ. But it also kind of had this oath of allegiance sort of meaning, this Roman meaning of of swearing an oath to a commanding officer. And... uh, that's, of course, that's how we get the English word sacrament. The sacramentum became the word that everyone used to describe these two ordinances. And uh, the best working definition of sacrament uh, came from the early church father, Augustine. And he said a sacrament is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. But if you know your church history at all, you know that the term sacrament and even Augustine's definition of it eventually becomes problematic for a couple of reasons. The the chief reason is that the word sacrament, kind of coupled with a really elastic use of the word grace, in uh, Augustine's definition, changed the nature of the rites of the Lord's Supper and baptism. They they began to morph and, and shift over time. Instead of signs of grace or images 
conveying present realities, the rituals began to be viewed as conveying grace in and of themselves. And a second reason is that the Roman Catholic tradition continued to develop other lesser sacraments, which were added. So there weren't just two by the Middle Ages, but seven sacraments, none of which were instituted by Christ. If you grew up and are familiar with the Catholic Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church, you know the other five, confirmation, confession, anointing the sick, last rites, that's this kind of the same one, um, marriage, holy orders, that would be like the priesthood, the deaconate, those sorts of things. And, and the problem with understanding sacraments that way and, and the conveyance of grace is it implies that, that, a, that a person can perform some sort of ritual, and that's why they started adding more, in order to receive grace as a reward for your effort for the performance of the ritual. And the biblical perspective is that genuine faith produces works. So sacraments can't be and are not the automatic or mechanical transmission of divine grace to a participant. But that's how the Catholic Church still regards them. That's how the Eastern Orthodox Church still regards them, and that's why they use that word sacrament and have seven, and why we would prefer the term ordinance and use two. But that's why the word sacrament is problematic. It's intended meaning shifted. And many of you go, but wait, I, I, I grew up Methodist, or I grew up Episcopal, or, or, or whatever it is, and you go, we, we use the word sacrament, and we only had two. Uh, got you, preacher. I know, I grew up Methodist. Um, and, and, and some of those denominational streams uh, of Christianity, uh, which we would define as Protestant, still prefer the term sacrament. Uh, without even intending the conveyance of grace uh, in, in the same way. But if you, if you grew up in the Bible church world, if you, if you grew up in the Southern Baptist world or other non-denominational churches that were non-mainline churches, you probably heard the word ordinance just to avoid the confusion of the erroneous understanding of, of sacrament. So that's, that's why that term is preferred, and that's why we will prefer that term today going forward. But you need to know the history why some people call them sacraments, why some people call them ordinances. Know that there, there is grace there to, to like-minded brothers and sisters that, that might prefer the other, but we prefer the term ordinance. So, so we have to move on to that discussion. That's just kind of a primer for understanding when we talk about ordinances, how that all came about and how it developed through the history of the church. And I'm condensing, just so you all know, what could probably be a, a three part series into one thing. I've only got one Sunday. We can't keep Stuart away for that long to let me talk about ordinances, then talk about baptism, then talk about the Lord's Supper each week, which would probably be more ideal. But So we're kind of doing a flyby, so there's probably going to be questions that I don't quite get to answer. There's going to be things that I don't quite get to say, but we want to give at least a cursory treatment of why we do these things. And so that's, that's where we're headed. And so we, we want to take them in logical order then, which would be the one that should be done first, which is the ordinance of baptism. So the ordinance of baptism is what I referred to earlier as an inaugural rite. You think of inaugural as the inauguration of, of somebody to political office, something like that. It's the beginning of something. Baptism is meant to happen at the beginning of your faith in Jesus Christ. And, and, and the word itself is a simple transliteration of the Greek word baptizo, which just means to immerse with water or wash with water. Uh, the first use of the term in the New Testament, of course, is related to John the Baptist, whom we just read about a few weeks ago. Mark, his treatment of the gospel, says this, Mark 1, verses 4 and 5, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river, confessing their sins. Now, I bring up John's baptism, not because it is the same as our baptism, it is different, but I bring it up to show that without exception, in the New Testament, baptism is tied to repentance and faith of the baptizee. So, so John's baptism is a precursor to Christian baptism, the baptism that you and I participate in. And it was irreducibly uh, tied to repentance. Other verses... Matthew 3, 6, they were baptized by John in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Matthew 3, 11, John said, I baptize you with water for repentance. In the Gospel and Acts, John's baptism is summarized as a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. 
Mark 1, 4, Luke 3, 3, and also Acts 13, 24, and 19, 4. But then Jesus institutes the rite for his church in the Great Commission, which, which we already read, baptizing them, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you, including baptizing each other, right? Baptize the disciples so that they may go make more disciples, baptize them. And the chain has continued unbroken for 2,000 years, and here we all are. And for this baptism, there, there is a shift in John's meaning because John's meaning was solely about repentance. In telling the story of the early church, Acts repeatedly tries Christian bath, baptism to repentance and faith. Repentance of our sins and faith in Christ. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That's Acts 2.38. Those who received his word, there's the belief element, those who received his word were baptized, Acts 2.41. And when they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. That's Acts 8.12. So these verses, along with many others, it, it becomes clear that Christian baptism precedes proceeds, rather, repentance and faith, which brings us to the uncomfortable question, what about all the stories in Acts where households are baptized? Well, one such instance is the story of the Philippian jailer. You may be familiar with it if you've read Acts. It's a really great story. The, the, the story of Paul and Silas in prison, a big earthquake, all the prisoners escape, and, the, and the, the jailer's about to fall on his sword, and Paul and Silas are like, wait, we didn't go anywhere. We're still here. Uh, and, and they share the gospel with him. And in Acts 16.33, it says this. It says, And then he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, that's Paul and Silas, and he, that is the jailer, was baptized at once, he and all his family. So, so maybe you've heard these texts uh, or other examples of household baptisms mentioned in Acts uh, 16, uh, Acts 18, and 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, often proponents of infant baptism argue that any infants in these households would have been baptized. That's how they approach these texts, to support the understanding that you can, in fact, baptize babies. But, but we have to understand the inherent weakness in that line of thinking, because nowhere in Scripture is there any instance of an infant actually being baptized. It's never explicitly talked about or discussed at all. The household baptisms are exceptions to this only if you assume that the household included infants, which the Bible doesn't say that it did. And in fact, Luke steers us away from that assumption even here. If you, if you go back two verses for the setup in Acts 16, uh, in verses 31 and 32, you, you see something striking. Verse 31, and, and they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in the house. So, so by saying that, that, that Paul spoke the word of the Lord to all who were in the jailer's house, and then baptizing them, subsequent to them hearing the word and believing, it sort of undercuts the idea that, that infants were present. I, I don't know about you, but if, have you ever tried to speak a deep theological truth to an infant and have them believe you? It doesn't work. I've just tried to be like, hey, stop that, you know, stop hitting your sister, and they, they don't even believe that. So they're very unconcerned with such things. And, and, and Luke is, is making it clear that, that, that the baptism that the household all heard Another instance, Luke clarifies this immediately in, in the ensuing sentence uh, that, uh, that simply being uh, in the newly Christian household was not enough for baptism. Belief in Jesus was a prerequisite. This is the example of household baptism in Acts 18. In verse 8, it says, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. So again, the whole household heard, the whole household believed, and the whole household was baptized. If Luke were going to clarify that some of the household were infants and being baptized based on their parents' faith, it, it would appear that he would probably make that caveat here, but he does not. He does the opposite, highlighting the hearing and believing as prerequisites. So, so there are other arguments about infant baptism. I grew up in the Methodist church. I was baptized as an infant and later was baptized as an adult, as a believing adult. So I'm, I'm sensitive to this issue. I know that there are those in here who maybe grew up in a, a different faith, and we, we can't do a full treatment of it here. But, but suffice to say, um, 
I know the book of Acts can be thorny uh, when you're looking at issues of this is how it's always done, right? The Acts, Acts is a unique time in the, the history of the church. But so briefly, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on just one additional argument uh, about infant baptism, um, which is to consider it, uh, this is what proponents do, they consider it the New Testament replacement for circumcision. Circumcision did happen to adults, they would argue, in the first generation uh, of, of Abraham and can happen to uh, adult converts of Judaism, but the normative practice in subsequent generations obviously would have been to circumcise children. Their faith would have been based on their parents' faith, and then that faith would have been fulfilled at their moment of understanding the promises, understanding the covenant. That is often an argument that you hear in favor of infant baptism. I'll only say to this that while the argument has a decent rationale on the surface, you could maybe draw some lines if you wanted to, it, it falls apart when we consider that link is never once drawn in the New Testament. In fact, the two books where one might expind, uh, expect to find such a link, Galatians, which deals with circumcision at length, mentions that not at all, and Hebrews, which is dealing both with Jewish traditions and their direct bearing on Christianity and how to understand them, it's absent. Such link is, is nowhere to be found. So you would think that the writers being inspired by God, if God meant to institute such a practice, would have inspired them to make that abundantly clear, and he did not. And then the other erroneous view of baptism that sometimes gets taught, that we have to briefly treat, is the idea of baptismal regeneration. That if you are, that you are not saved until you are baptized. We don't have time to treat this one at length either. There's a lot of proponents of this. Some that grew up in the Church of Christ world might be familiar with some of the arguments. And as, as we said, since we believe the ordinances are not conveying grace in and of themselves, then we have to reject that the baps, baptism is not necessary for salvation, even if it is a truly important act of obedience in the life of the believer. So the first thing that I would say, and this is usually an argument that people immediately bring to mind because it, it is one that we can all think of, is what about the thief on the cross? Today you will be with me in paradise. He didn't get baptized. He was hanging there next to Jesus. And Jesus makes it very clear. Hey, get down, get baptized. That's not what he says. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, we know he's a special case, and you don't build a whole theology on baptism around the thief on the cross. But one thing it says is that baptism can't be absolutely necessary because it wasn't in this case. So, so where does that leave us as we've kind of treated some of the erroneous views of baptism? What is baptism for? What is baptism really? What power does it actually have in the life of the believer? Well... Baptism expresses union with Christ in his death and resurrection. It is an expression of that. And the clearest teaching on this comes from the book of Romans, chapter 6. Verses 3 and 4 say, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Now, in the wider context of Romans, I think it, it's wrong to say that, that water baptism is the means of our being united to Christ. It's not the means. You'll hear me say that a lot. In Romans, faith is the means by which we are united to Christ. Faith is the means by which we are justified. We, we preached through that for over a year. You all remember but we show this faith, we, we say this faith, we signify this faith, we symbolize this faith with the act of baptism. Faith unites us to Christ, and baptism symbolizes that union. So, so we're left with this concept of, of baptism. This is, this is the Evan Godbold definition. It is a singular, inaugural, symbolic ritual that demonstrates our faith in Jesus Christ a faith which, us, which unites us to him in the likeness of his death, burial, and resurrection. That's why when we baptize a believer, next Sunday we will do this. You will see our baptismal over here. We say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And often we will say, buried in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in the newness of life. That's just the distillation of the instruction from Matthew 28, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the instruction in Romans chapter 6. 
So that's, that's baptism. There's much more to say, I'm, I'm aware. But, but again, we're, we have a, a limited amount of time, and I, I want to focus on some specific applications, and we still have to treat the Lord's Supper. So let's turn to the Lord's Supper. If baptism is instituted as a singular ritual, then the other ordinance was designed to not be observed just once, but regularly. That's the Lord's Supper. Luke's account of it from Luke chapter 22, 19 and 20 says this. It says, And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he, that is Jesus, broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. This here is a, a concise account of the two elements given, bread and cup, body and blood, poured out. And, and much confusion over communion still persists today. We've had 2,000 years of this rite, this ritual morphing over time, getting lots of erroneous things placed upon it, pulled out of it, shifted, changed. And so we, we, need, to, we need to treat that a little bit and, and, and just understand some of the history. Much, much confusion is, again, from the, from the Catholic and sacramental understanding that, that's placed upon this ordinance. We, we already said that the unfortunate and erroneous understanding of the supper is that it's a means of grace. That, that permeated the church relatively early. That, that, that became part of Christian practice relatively early. But just as troubling was an erroneous view of the elements themselves. And that's based on a verse in John 6, which is Jesus speaking. He says, for my Flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. That's John 6.55. And so we would say, of course, Jesus is speaking figuratively here, as he is part of the, uh, he's treating his bread of life discourse. I am the bread of life. And just as he also says he is the light of the world, and that he is the true vine, and that he is the gate, we would say all of those things are obviously figurative. But many people in the Middle Ages, unfortunately, took that literally. And... uh, it wouldn't be untangled uh, for a while either. In fact, it would, it, would con- it would grow from sort of a, well, yeah, that's fine to believe, to dogma of the church, to whole systems being developed around how that worked. And it, it, it would not be undone all at once. It, it happened gradually, beginning with the reformer Martin Luther 500 years ago. And, and the, the more spurious views on the, on the Lord's Supper finally began to be corrected, but as views on it began to change, you, you might say each kind of incremental change away from the heresy sort of formed a new stop as to how you could think about communion. And uh, the change in understanding sort of created about four camps, about four views that you could speak about today. So of the four prevailing views, the first is transubstantiation. That's a famous seminary word. Uh, But all it really means is, if this is from the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox tradition, that the elements retain their appearance and their sensory composition. You can taste bread, you can taste wine, but they are actually not that. They have been metaphysically transformed from simple bread and wine to become the literal body and blood of Jesus Christ. More than that, the ritual is considered sacrificial, It is considered, to use another big scriptural word, propitiatory. It is meant as a crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Again, for you to ingest his literal body and literal blood is for you to attain grace by more sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Because Christ is literally present in the elements, his body is literally broken and his blood is literally shed. Again, that is what Catholics and Orthodox Christians believe. And so because of this, because it is a means of grace, and because Christ is literally being sacrificed again, the ritual is emphasized heavily uh, above even preaching of the word because it's the means by which people are receiving grace week in and week out. That is literally why the mass that happens in the Catholic Church always includes the Lord's Supper, or they would call it the Eucharist or Communion. And then... To combat that heresy, you have consubstantiation. Consubstantiation means that the bread is present with 
the body and blood. So it's not a full-on transformation. This is sort of the Lutheran understanding, by the way. It's, it's that the literal body and blood of Jesus are present in, with, and under. Those are Luther's words. In, with, and under the elements. Luther tried to split hairs here. You've got to remember about Martin Luther. He was a Catholic monk. He grew up thinking a lot of his life one way about communion. And so he's kind of going, oh, well, I don't want to throw all of it out but I definitely see some problems, so let me uh, try and kind of incrementally move us away from, from what I see. So his big thing was he was getting rid of the, of the sacrificial idea. He was like, no, 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 we're saved by grace through faith. The communion is not conveying grace in that way. Now, Luther was trying to split hairs there too because he was, he was, he was, just, he was tripped up by John 6.55 still. Everybody was. And, and so be, because he wanted the, the body and blood to be present. He kind of had this idea that, well, they're both there. That's why you still taste the other thing. That's why you taste the, the bread. That's why you taste the cup. But because the ritual was not sacrificial and was not a means of grace as the way the Catholics mean it, Luther was on the right track. But he, he still liked the term sacrament. He still liked the idea of a means of grace, even though he was reinterpreting it closer back to Augustine's view, right? Oh, this is, this is just something that, that, that draws us into closer fellowship. This is just something. Um, and, and he was unwilling to say that it was a work of, of our own at all. In fact, he was, he was known to say that none of the means depend on the works of the person administering it or the person receiving it. Rather, the efficacy of these means, or efficacy of these means, rests in God alone. So, so Luther, again, he was on the right track. He was trying to kind of pull this thing out of this idea that this is a sacrifice, that you need to do this all the time in order to stay right with God. And then you get the, the, the following view, which again moves us a little bit further away from how it was, which is the real or spiritual presence view. And this is a broadly reformed view, and it's common in several different Protestant denominations. And proponents teach that Christ's body and blood are really present. And they're not going to say physically, they're going to say really or actually present, but that the presence is communicated in a, in a spiritual manner. Gone are the idea that we're eating or drinking Jesus' flesh and blood at all, but, but, the, but the, the elements contain the real or spiritual presence of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And instead, through the Holy Spirit, God's grace is put on display as participants are nourished spiritually by Christ's body and blood. And greater emphasis on mystery here, obviously, is, is warranted. They're not trying to tell you how it is done. Proponents of this view are less concerned with the metaphysical minutia of how that's happening. One reformer even said, I shall not be ashamed to confess that it is a secret too lofty for either my mind to comprehend or my words to declare. I rather experience it than understand it. And so proponents of this view often do not celebrate it every Lord's Day because it's diminishing it from you need to do this in order to stay right with God to we should do this regularly, which is the common perspective that a lot of Protestant Christians have. And then the final one is the symbolic and memorial view. This moved even further. Other reformers were moving as far away from Catholicism as they could, and they pulled away from any type of real presence, any type of spiritual nourishment. The elements were now merely symbolic representations of Christ's body and blood. This bread is just bread. This wine is just wine. But they represent or symbolize the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ. And so instead of spiritual nourishment, the, the supper was merely meant to memorialize and remember, which Jesus, and Christ, Jesus Christ himself encourages us to do as we take the supper in remembrance of him. So of these four views, we can, we can easily dismiss the transubstantiation view, the, the, the first view. It's an unbiblical innovation. Um, consubstantiation, likewise, is still very problematic because it's, it's hewing very closely to that one. It's kind of trying to have its cake and, and eat it too. Um, bread and eat it too. Zing. But the bulk of the evangelical world finds itself somewhere on the spectrum between three and four, between spiritual presence or merely memorial symbolic. If you're wondering where I'm going, like, you have to be here. I'm not going to actually say that. One <laughs> caution, though, I will give you is that the strictly symbolic or memorial view 
can easily dismiss the right itself as unimportant. That can and does happen. When people maintain just a symbolic view, we kind of go to ourselves, well, well, I have other ways of remembering Jesus. I don't need to drink, you know, grape juice and have a cracker to remember Jesus. In fact, it might be better to just sing another worship song or have somebody do a, a, a scripture reading that helps me remember Jesus. So it, it can, not saying it always does in all cases, but it can trivialize it to the degree that it becomes almost utterly unconcerning or unimportant. Well, we do this when we want. It's a cool thing to do. Jesus set it up, but whatever. So we have to be very careful. If we go full symbolic to maintain that this was instituted by Christ, this was to be done regularly, as often as we eat and drink, we are to do this in remembrance of Jesus. Also, churches with a merely symbolic view tend to do the supper less frequently, which in and of itself is not problematic. There is no prescription from the Bible on how often we do this thing. But it can breed unfamiliarity. If you don't do it very much, unfamiliarity can rob something of its impact because the whole time you're going, wait, what is this? Why are we doing it? And you have to re-explain it. Just like doing it too much can rob it of its impact because it becomes rote or ritualistic, which we're also afraid of, that, that can be problematic too. So there's variance here. The brothers and sisters uh, uh, that are like-minded disagree about some of these things, and that's okay. On the other side, we have to be careful that we don't over-spiritualize the Lord's Supper. It's not magic. Nothing is happening in here that's going to make you better or make you more holy. That is, in and of the elements themselves. Maybe the self-reflection that's going on in the Lord's Supper is going to make you better because the Spirit is going to reveal to you something about yourself, and it's going to cause you to repent. It's going to cause you to see Christ in a new way. So, like baptism, the supper is best understood as an important, important observance, not to be undertaken lightly at all, but not something that conveys grace or salvation. So, you notice I don't, I don't fully come down on one or the other, but I'm, I'm, I'm issuing some principles here of caution, of moderation when it comes to to those two views of, of the Lord's Supper. And, and, and this is because this is the type of attitude that, that Paul has on display in 1 Corinthians 11. So let's, let's read this treatment of it together. He says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So, so here Paul is warning against being unworthy concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Literally, people are getting sick and even dying because they are performing the ritual in an unworthy manner. And that, that doesn't mean, by the way, that they, that they switched the wine for grape juice or, or, or started observing it monthly instead of weekly. That's not the unworthiness that, that Paul is getting at. It means that their hearts were not remembering what it was for. It means that they were not discerning the body, verse 29, the broken body of Jesus Christ. For some, this, this might serve, again, as, as evidence that maybe something more than just mere symbolism is, is, is at play, because Paul says, when you don't acknowledge the body and blood, you are drinking judgment on yourself. We remember Nadab and Abihu from, from Ben's scripture reading. God wants to be worshipped rightly, so don't innovate needlessly or trivialize what has been instituted by God. We cannot do that. So, in the few minutes that, that we have left, I want to try and give a, at least a few thoughts, a few applications about these ordinances. Some of you may have lingering questions. There's a lot of practical things, obviously, that get, that get brought up as, as we talk about these things. So I want to try and treat a few of those if, if we can. One of them is, is, is mode. What about mode? That is, is there, a, is there a right way or a wrong way to perform these things? Um, obviously, when we think about baptism and we think about mode, 
we, we think about whether it's okay to sprinkle versus immerse. At Tomball Bible Church, we practice baptism by immersion. You see that anytime we bring our baptistry out. That is, that is how we practice it. We remember that the word, as we said, it means immersion. So that's a pretty big argument in favor of that type of practice. And, and we can say with confidence as well that, that that is how the ritual was performed throughout the world in the early church. Every, every seemingly biblical example that we can find seems to indicate going down into the water and coming up of the water. And that is because that very well demonstrates and symbolizes being buried with Christ and raised to new life. So that's, that's how we perform it here. Are there exceptions? That's a question that we like to ask because it's fun. Potentially, maybe, um, someone confined to a hospital bed that can't get out, could they maybe be poured instead uh, or sprinkled or, 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 or some such thing? Ask your elders. Uh, I think so. I think that that is a good exception. Similarly, um, we, we can look back not at Scripture but at, at, at church history. Uh, there's, a, there's a document called the Didache. Uh, and this early, early document, this is late first century, early second century, is not scripture, is probably not written by the apostles, but it does contain a lot of instructions for early Christian practice. And here's what it had to say about baptism. Remember, not scripture. Evan, not equating this with scripture. Everybody hear that? Okay. But, interesting. Now, concerning baptism, baptize as follows. After you have reviewed all these things, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in running water. But if you have no running water, then baptize in some other water. And if you're not able to baptize in cold water, then do so in warm. But if you have neither, then pour water on the head three times in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, again, this is not the Bible. This is not, this is, this is not God, God's word to us. But it does show how early Christians viewed baptism. They viewed it as, it's best practice to do it this way. If you can't do it that way, well, maybe try the next best way. They didn't have indoor plumbing. They didn't have running water. There would be lots of moments where you go, hey, man, the nearest river is like 10 miles away. You know, how, how are we going to do this? And a lot of them would probably say, we hike down to the river, and that's how we do it. But someone would be like, you know what? This person is very old. It's, let's just draw some water from a well, and let's pour it over them. That is, is how best to, to look at that. Now, we have indoor plumbing. We have running water. We have the ability to, to pull a baptistry out and fill it. And that should be the prescribed mode for how we approach baptism. We should not let the exception become the rule. And that is really the problem that happened in the early church, is the exception became the rule. It was hard to find water. So, ah, just sprinkle them. That's what we started doing. Oh, we're doing babies now. Yeah, that gets dicey, dunking them in the water. So let's just, let's sprinkle them. And so it became this pragmatic, overly pragmatic approach. So what about, what about frequency of baptism? That's, that's another question that we get. I got baptized. As a child, I thought I believed, but, you know, as an adult, I'm, I'm not sure I really did. Should I, should I get baptized again? That's a really common question that, that pastors get. And there's not a set answer. We, we kind of want to explore, well, why did you get baptized? Was it because a friend was doing it? Is it because your parents wanted you to do it? Was, was, was your faith not genuine? Did you not really? Those are real questions. So, so the answer is maybe you should, maybe not. Maybe your faith as a four-year-old was as genuine as mine is today. That is incredibly possible. We should never underestimate our children's ability to grab these deep concepts. But we should also be cautious. We should be cautious. We shouldn't push people or pressure people into baptism before they're ready, which can often happen in, in certain streams that, that emphasize baptism very heavily. So we, we have to watch out for that. What about somebody that was baptized as an infant and then sort of realized over time, oh, hey, I'm not sure that that was actually a baptism. That was me. That was me. I became a Christian after I was baptized. I was baptized as an infant, and then at age 11, I trusted Christ at my, in my bunk bed by myself. After hearing the gospel, reading the scriptures that my pastor had laid out for me, I was like, oh, I don't, didn't know this. I didn't believe this. And then because I grew up in a stream of faith that taught that that baptism was now fulfilled, for a long time, I just thought I was kind of okay. I was like, okay, well, then my baptism is effectual for me now. That's the teaching. And then I started just, I don't know, reading my Bible, and I was kind of like, I don't know. Talked to other believers about that. 
And I kind of realized that my brother-in-law, Kevin Bowles, who does Behold the Lamb of God with me every year, baptized me as an adult when I was 19 years old. So I'm kind of an adult. Sorry, teenagers. But, and, and that is my baptism. That is what I look upon. I don't look upon the thing that happened to me when, a baby, when I was a baby that I don't remember. And that's the sign of baptism. Baptism is so that we can look back and say, do you remember? Do you remember when you stood before your brothers and sisters, your loved ones, your family, your church family, and said, this is what I believe, and this is how I'm going to demonstrate it. I'm going to be buried, and I'm going to be raised, just as Christ was buried and was raised. That's what baptism is for. So, use cases for baptism. There are many, and if you have questions about it, it is not too late to sign up for baptism. We are doing that next week. And if you are like me, you grew up in a stream that baptized babies, but you later trusted Christ and you've gone, oh, I think it's fine. Search your heart. If you want to talk to a pastor, I would love to talk to you. I, that was my experience, and I can tell you why maybe that's not the right way to think about it. Moving on, we have, we have to come back to, to the Lord's Supper, to, to the mode of Lord's Supper. There's a lot with mode in Lord's Supper, more so than just do we, do we sprinkle or do we dip, uh, like baptism. There is how often... What kind of things do we use? Bread and wine or, or, or crackers and grape juice? And, and we have to actually understand that, that nothing in, in Scripture is actually specified about the way that the bread is broken. We know that it was unleavened because it was in, in tandem with the Passover meal. And, and we only know fruit of the vine. Um, now, obviously, that was most likely wine, given the context. But is it permissible to use grape juice? I think so. Absolutely. The only, the only statement about what was in the cup is, is just, I will tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of this vine until the day when I drink it anew in my Father's kingdom. That's, that's Christ's words in, in Matthew 26, 29. And so there, there's nothing in the text that commands or, or forbids the other. But what we should be concerned about with regard to mode is like, I don't know, like playful, weird substitutes. I was at a... a a thing one time with the college ministry, and we'll get to this in a second on why maybe we shouldn't have done communion at all. Um, but they used saltine crackers and red Kool-Aid because that was what they had. And I kind of went, eh, I don't know if I like. Why don't we just do cookies and milk? You know, why don't we? Why don't we just do bagels and Coke around the campfire? You know, is it just whatever you have on hand? We can get just like with the baptism thing. We can start to kind of go. Well, it's, it's what they had. They didn't have bread. So we, we just did it with, uh, you know, salad. I'm like, okay, wait, what? So, so if you can't do it right, maybe wait until you can. Um, so that's, that's one thing, especially if the Lord's Supper doesn't have to happen at some specified time, but, but is somewhat discretionary as to when we can do it. So that's, that's one thing. That's, that's just elements. What do we use as elements? Then the next thing is, is frequency. At, at, uh, you know, I, I mentioned in... Uh, in passing, that, that, that there's nothing in the New Testament about frequency in, in the Lord's Supper, and some uh, believe that it would be good to do it weekly, but others only practice it quarterly. And they believe the same things that you and I believe about the Lord's Supper. And, and we're in the med- middle here at, at Tomball Bible Church. We, we tend to celebrate it monthly, sometimes twice a month. And, and we are usually doing it on the, not like clockwork, but usually we are doing it on the second Sunday of the month. Now, this month we didn't because I was going to be teaching on it, so we're doing it today. This is the last Sunday of the month. So there is liberty in how we approach communion. But the question becomes one of what frequency and infrequency correspond to the proper importance. That's the best way to think about it. Because we have to think about the ministry and the Word of God and this as a proper response to the teaching of the Word, to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And then what frequency or infrequency helps us feel its value rather than becoming either callous to it or naive to it? And those aren't easy judgments to make, and different churches make them in different ways, and so we have to have some charity there. And then last is just sort of nomenclature. How do we, what do we call it? You've, you've probably heard me, I might have even slipped up a couple times and said it is communion instead of Lord's Supper. There's also the word Eucharist, which just means Thanksgiving. And, and, all of these are applied to the supper, all of these titles, uh, and each kind of highlights a, a, a significant aspect of, of the ordinance. So, so in, in my view, they're all fine to say, Lord's Supper is probably the most appropriate, 
and most satisfactory only if because it reminds us as Christians that we are sharing a bread and a cup that are not at our table but his. This is the Lord's. This is the Lord's Supper. This is something that he instituted. This isn't something that we made up. But it, does it bring about communion, greater communion, greater fellowship with one another? It should. Does it bring about greater fellowship with the Lord? It should. Should we approach it with a spirit of deep thanksgiving, Eucharisto? We should. So, so these words are, are highlighting attributes, aspects of the supper. And they're, they're all in bounds. But if you grew up in a non-denominational stream, you probably are not used to communion or Eucharist as much as you are used to Lord's Supper. So some of it is just kind of where are you from, how do you approach it? And then we, we, we want to kind of drill down a little bit as, as, as we finish out today, which is just kind of like, can we summarize these things? Can we, can we, and, and so much more could be said. What, where, where does this all leave us? Okay, I haven't tried to give us some guideposts, some guide rails. So, so here's, here's baptism. I may or may not have stolen this. Baptism was unequivocally commanded by the Lord Jesus. So you're writing something down, you can write that down. It was unequivocally commanded by the Lord Jesus. It was also universally administered to Christians entering the early church. Unequivocally commanded, universally administered. It was also uniquely connected to conversion, right? So uniquely connected to conversion as an unrepeatable expression of saving faith. So those, those are sort of the four things that we can think about when we think about how baptism works and what it's for. So baptism was unequivocally commanded by the Lord Jesus Christ. It was universally administered to Christians entering the early church. It was uniquely connected to conversion as an unrepeatable expression of saving faith. So, so if you have not been baptized, I'll say again, good news, we are baptizing next week. There's information in your program on how you can become part of that process. If you're interested in taking that next step of obedience, you can also speak with me afterwards. We would love to baptize you if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ and have not been baptized. So for the Lord's Supper, I want to highlight six things that the Lord's Supper does. You can write these down if you're writing things down as well. And this is how we are to understand the Lord's Supper. So you might write that. The Lord's Supper is understood as proclaiming the gospel. When we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim Christ's death until he returns, right? That's the 1 Corinthians 11 passage. The Lord's Supper is understood as remembering Jesus. The Lord's Supper is memorial. We are doing this in remembrance of Christ, his set his sacrifice in our place, his substitutionary death. We are remembering and reflecting on that. The Lord's Supper is a feasting on Christ. There's a reason bread and wine were chosen. Now, we are not literally eating or drinking Christ, but the image is there to remind us of the constant spiritual nourishment that we need and have in Christ Jesus through his substitutionary death. So the Lord's Supper is understood as a feasting on Christ. It is understood as a meal. Fourth, the Lord's Supper is understood as savoring the new covenant. There is a new covenant. It is instituted by Christ Jesus. The covenant is his blood. No longer are we having to stand in front of an altar or having a priest stand in front of an altar and sacrifice animals for us. Christ's substitutionary death has paid it all. And in this age of grace, this church age, we are sharing in his sufferings as we savor his new covenant. Fifth, the Lord's Supper is understood as a call to love the church. This goes back to not partaking of it in an unworthy manner. Now, some people conflate the teaching in the Sermon on the Mount about going and leaving a gift at the altar to go reconcile with your brother as having to do with communion. That, that can happen. That, those, are separate, those are separate things. But the idea of drinking in an unworthy manner, if you do have something against a brother and you're ready to, to have communion, you probably should go and reconcile with your brother before you partake of it. You should be able to say, this is meant to unify us. This is meant to show that we are all one body. We are all partaking of the same elements together. So it's a call to love one another as Christ loved the church. 
as brothers and sisters in his body. And number six, the Lord's Supper is understood as a call to self-examination. Examine yourselves. See where you are with him before you take the bread and take the cup. Do not drink judgment on yourself. Do not drink it in an unworthy manner. If there is sin in your heart, if there's unconfessed sin against somebody that you love, somebody that you care about, maybe let the cup pass and reconcile. If there's deep discouragement, that doesn't mean don't take the cup. In fact, the cup and the bread, that might be exactly what you need to be nourished, to be encouraged. But if there's sin, if there's deep-seated sin, you need to get right with God before you take the bread and drink the cup. So that's what we're going to do in just a moment. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and before I step down, I'm going to go ahead and invite our men that are going to be serving to to come on up. Our band can come up as well. Since we've done an at-length treatment of communion, I'm going to pray and then we're going to take it. So let's pray and then we'll take it together.